that uh, uh, this country, uh, this uh, our country, is suffering from uh, rebellion, disobedience in leadership, and that's not necessarily a feel-good message. But always understand that the Bible gives us good and bad, and I, I, I really do try to balance the good and the bad. I think I preach more good than the negative side, uh, but I think we all need to hear it from time to time. And even in this, um, I believe that even when God allows the bad, it's in order to get us to turn back to him. I really believe that God is trying to get our attention about some things. I think some things that have just spiraled out of control. And many of you know that I do watch CNN probably too much, and I do watch MSNBC probably too much. And uh, the more I look at it, the more I, I'm just convinced that the world in which we live in, uh, some parts of the world, is just out of control. We can't even agree in Christian circles about some things. You know, there are some things that we are split, even as believers, we are split in uh, trying to understand the leadership of this country. Uh, so, again, I, 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 I do believe that God is trying to uh, get us to turn back, to, to uh, look at our lives, and to turn back to Him. Uh, the first parable was the parable of, of the, the lost sheep. And Jesus, telling the parable, talks, says, which of you who had 99, had 100, had 100 sheep, and one got lost, wouldn't you leave the 99 and go to the one? Uh, uh, and uh, he knew uh, that it was the practice of shepherds uh, that the sheep were so precious to them that they didn't even want to lose one. And it should be, it is the nature of God that he doesn't want anybody to perish and to go to hell. Uh, the will of God is that all would come to repentance, that all would come to repentance and be saved. That's the will of God. But we know as people go that not, not, every, not everybody's going to be saved. Now, that some people will not accept the Lord Jesus Christ for whatever the reason. Uh, in this parable, Jesus said, uh, uh, the shepherd loses the, 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 the one and go, looks for the one, leaves the 99 and goes and look for the one sheep that was lost. It was also the practice of the shepherd that even if the sheep died, he had to bring back the skin of the sheep in order to determine how the sheep died, what killed the sheep. That shepherd left the 99, went after the one, searching for that one, and when he found the one, the Bible says that he put that sheep over his shoulders, went back home uh, rejoicing, and when he got home, he says to his neighbors, come rejoice with me. For the one sheep that was lost has now been found. And look at how the Lord ends that parable in verse 7. For uh, uh, heaven rejoices, the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that comes to repentance um, uh, 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 instead of the 99, as opposed to the 99 just persons. God rejoices over the one who comes back, who comes back home. And that should be our posture. Whenever, even in church, whenever somebody comes to the Lord, I, I really do want the congregation to rejoice with them. That's a big moment in that person's life. They don't, be, they don't even know how big it really is at the time. But that's one of the best decisions that that person will ever make in their whole entire life. Uh, the Bible says uh, that uh, that shepherd was happy to get that one sheep back. 
he didn't end there, but he goes to verses 8 through 10. And he talks about the lost coin. Which woman of you who had ten coins and you lost one? Uh, the, Jesus, in telling this parable, says that the woman who lost the one coin, she didn't just, she wasn't just satisfied for the nine that she had, but she swept the house until she could find that one coin that was lost. Uh, but the, the culture at that time, and some commentaries uh, teach that the coin represented, uh, the ten coins represented a, a dowry, that dowry that, that dowry that she would uh, get at her wedding. It was like a wedding ring. And And when that woman, any woman, who would lose their wedding ring and you knew that ring was in the house, wouldn't you sweep that house until you could find that one coin that was lost? Jesus telling the story knew that in that day and time that woman would do just that. She swept the house until she found that one lost coin. When she found the coin, she rejoiced. And Jesus again says, uh, uh, the, the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that comes to repentance than the, the 99, than 99 just persons. So we are always remember that Jesus said, I came for the lost. Amen. I didn't come for righteous, but I came for the unrighteous. Uh, Jesus said, they that are whole don't need a doctor, but they that are sick. And I'm glad today that Jesus didn't come for so-called good people, but Jesus came for bad people and ugly people and ugly acting people. That's what I mean by ugly. Ugly acting people because the power of the gospel is that when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, he is able to transform your life from one thing to another thing. He can take you out of darkness into the marvelous light. And let's, let's always remember that we who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we that are saved, we ought to live a certain kind of life. And that life should line up with the Bible. Amen. And if we fall, if we sin, when we fall, when we sin, uh, I'm glad that we have a God who is able to forgive us of all of our sins. That was the second parable uh, that Jesus told in this uh, chapter. And last week, this is where we ended up, uh, St. Luke 15 11 through 24, all right? 11 through 24. And this is the prodigal, the, the parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son, okay? The Bible tells us Jesus, in telling this story, and for many, many years, whenever I taught this parable, and when I've even heard this parable, we, we, we tend, we tend, we preachers, we teachers tend to make uh, 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 the hero in the story of the son, when in reality, the hero in the story is the father, okay? And when we want to see God's nature, let's, don't look at the son, we represent the son, but when we look and see the nature of God, we ought to be looking at how the Father reacted to the Son. And Jesus, in telling the story, says that the younger son, the younger son, a certain man had two sons. 
and the younger son asked the father for his inheritance, okay? Now, in Jesus' day, the older son would get two-thirds of the father's inheritance, and the, the younger son would get a third of the father's inheritance. Not only would the oldest son get two-thirds, but the older son, uh, he, he would carry on the birthright of the father. He would carry on the name of the father. So the oldest son got two-thirds, and the younger son received a third. This young man goes to his father and asks his father to give him the portion <laughs> that falls to him. What a nerve, okay? The boy who had not earned anything, now he's coming to his father and saying to his father, give me the portion that falleth to me. In that culture, that was really disrespectful to the father. And if one of your children would come to you and say to you, well, I want you to give me uh, what, what you're going to give me now. I ain't going to wait, give it to me now. You would probably feel some kind of way. You would probably feel insulted that that child would treat you in that manner. But look at the father. When the father was asked to give the young man uh, the portion that him, he gives it to him. He gives it to the boy. And the Bible says that the boy left town, left home. He, he left he, he left, he left the father. And listen, whenever you leave the father, you're going to get in some kind of trouble. Always stay. Don't let anybody, don't let anything draw your attention away from the father. This boy was distracted. He thought because he had some money now, that he was good to go, he could go live any kind of way, and he probably did live any kind of way. He left the father, and the Bible says he began to live a riotous life. He began uh, to be uh, living riotously, okay? He was just doing whatever he wanted to do. Now, note that the Bible does not tell us what the riotous living is, okay? It, ne it never says what the boy did, all right? Now, the elder father had, the elder brother had in his mind what he thought the father, the brother did, but but it ne the Bible never says what the boy did. He goes and spend, wasted what he had on riotous, riotous, riotous living, okay? Riotous living. And the Bible says that when he, and, and this is the backdrop, when he wasted his substance, when he squandered his substance, the Bible says he began to be in want. He began to be in want. There, there's an old saying that want always follows waste. If you waste it, one day you're going to want it. Now, you don't have to say amen to this, but in my lifetime, I've wasted money and I've wasted time. I've wasted money, I've wasted time, and guess what? When you waste money, you, if that's what you look back at and you say, well, I wish I had done something different with that money. Or when you waste time, and some of us are getting older now, I don't know who you are, even if you're young, know that you're not going to stay young, that will come a time you're going to look at your life and you're going to see that your time is limited. I can remember, I can remember starting my pastorate uh, 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 vocation uh, at, at 30. 31 years later now. And I can't tell you where the time went. 
It went so very quickly. Time flies. I, I have I have a, a couple of granddaughters uh, who are who are young adults now, uh, long from maybe something in college in college. Okay, have their own lives now uh, because because time flies. And if you waste time, there's going to come a time when you look back at your life and you say, Well, I wish I had used my time better. And, and, and sidebar here, how many of us wish we could go back and, uh, uh, at people and say to some people and look back at it and say, the time I spent with that person was a waste of time. Amen. Amen. He, he, he wasted his living on riotous living and then he began to be in want. The Bible says that after he was in want, now he joins himself with a foreigner, okay, a person from that country. He joins himself with that foreigner. He is hungry. And because he is hungry now, he gets a job, and the job is a job that he should not have taken. He shouldn't have been there, okay? His job is what? Feeding, feeding swine. And as a Jew, he, he should have had nothing to do with feeding swine, touching swine. He shouldn't have been close to swine at all. And because he was close to the, uh, the swine, uh, listen to this, he was so hungry that he began, he began to eat what the swine were eating. This boy was at the lowest point in his life. And when he got to the lowest point in his life, the Bible says that in the pig pen, in the pig pen, in the pig pen, the Bible says he, and this is a classic scripture, this is a classic uh, uh, a phrase in the Bible. In, in the pig pen, he came, he, he came to himself. Right? He came to himself. Now the thing that I'm, one of the things that I'm most grateful for is that God allows U-turns. Y'all heard that term before. That's not a new saying. You've heard that saying before, that God allows U-turns. At any point, and, and, and I want us to really get a hold of this. At any point in your life, you can turn it around. I don't care how far you think you are out there. I don't care how bad it is. At any point in your life, you can make a U-turn. You can turn back to God. And while people might not let you back, God will always let you back. All God wants is for you to do what? You need to come to yourself. I believe that sometimes God lets us hit rock bottom in order for, in order for us to discover that we really do need God. What we thought we needed, we don't need. And there are some things we thought we needed. There are some people we thought we needed. But God will let you have some things. He'll let you have some people only for you to find out that they weren't all that they were cracked up to be. And God will get, put you in a position where you will have to do what? You will have to come to yourself. And I believe, that that, I believe that's what God is saying to the nation. I believe that's what God is saying to you and I. I believe God is saying all he wants us to do is to come to ourselves. Now maybe you maybe you've never gone anywhere, you've never done anything, and maybe you just as pure as the driven snow, you've never done anything that you're embarrassed about, uh, guilty, feel guilty about, feel ashamed of. But some of us have been there, that we've done some things, we've been some places, 
that we should not have gone and we should not have done. But I'm glad that no matter how far down we go, God will allow us to turn around and come back to you. The U-turn is with this these parables is all about in the first place. The U-turn is about repentance. It's about saying, God, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. It's about, and, and, and we, we, should, we should never forget that re repentance is a change, is a change of mind. It means I've changed my mind that, that I used to think this, but now I change my mind. And God allows us to change our minds. And when you change your mind, God accepts you back. Thank, thank God. God accepts you back. You know, some, some relationships we are in, were in, some relationships could be restored if we would just go back to the person and let them know, one, we're sorry for what happened, and two, you were right. I was wrong. Because now you what? You came to yourself. Okay? Now, now I'm a grown man, and there are some, there are some things my mother and father told me, advised me, that I wish I had listened. And when I did not listen, I paid the cost. I paid the price. But all we have to do when it comes to God is to have a change of mind, a change of heart. If we repent, God will receive us back. And the other, the other great part, and we're going to see this in the rest of this story, uh, that when the boy came to himself, not only will God receive you back, but God will, and this, you need to write this down, he, he will restore you. He will restore you. What you thought it was too late for God to do, God can still make that happen in your life. If you only repent, God will put you back in that place where you belong in the first place. If we would only come to ourselves and repent. Now, that is really in my mind. I'm going to move on in this parable, but it's really in my mind. When we talk about repentance, what's really in my mind, in the back of my mind, and God keeps speaking it to me, is that when we uh, repent and God restore, he, he restores us, okay, he will, he will treat you, he will treat you like you never did it. He will treat you like you never did it. Now, ain't that a great thing? You know, some people will never let you live some things down. But God will treat you like you never did it. That, that's, called, that's called restoration. He'll trust you again. He'll put you back in the place where he had intended for you to be in the first place. All right? He will restore us. The Bible says that uh, the boy, while in the pig pen, he had to hit rock bottom. Okay? And, and parents, parents, sometimes you can't always save your child from hitting rock bottom. Sometimes they need to hit rock bottom before they come to themselves. You can't keep throwing money at it. You can't think that just because you keep giving them money, keep paying their rent, keep paying the cell phone, keep paying the car note. Some things they have to hit rock bottom for them to come to themselves. The Bible says that the boy came to himself. Now listen to the boy. Read it. It's in that 15th chapter. Now read the story. The boy came to himself and he said, I will rise up and go back to my father because in my father's house 
The servants are eating better than I am. The servants are eating better than I am. I'm not even a servant. I'm a son. But the servants are eating better than I am. I will rise up. I will rise up. I will what? Go back. Go back to my father. And listen to the boy. I will rise up. I will go back to my father. Listen to the boy. And the boy says, to him, he's rehearsing what he's going to say to his father. Father, I am, I'm not even worthy to be your son. Make me as a hired servant. All right? I will rise up. I'll go back. I will repent. I'll tell the father I'm sorry. And the boy with that, with that, the boy gets up, gets out of the hog pen, and begins to go back to his father. The Bible says, and this is one of the, this, this is one of the most beautiful stories in the Bible, that when the boy comes back, now we don't know what the father was doing. We don't know if he was in the house or if he was in the field. It doesn't say what the father was doing. But somehow, when the boy came back home, the father saw him. And look, look, look at Jesus telling the story. But, uh, Jesus, the father, saw him a, a far off. He wasn't even close. But when the boy went home, the father saw him afar off. He wasn't close to the house, but the father knew his son. And those of us who are parents, you, you know, you know your children. You know their walk. You can tell their walk. They can be a distance, but you can tell it's them how they walk. When people in a crowd, if you're in a crowd, and, and your child calls your name, you know, you know the voice of your child. This father, I believe, it doesn't say in this parable, it's a story, but we would put it to life. This father probably was looking for the son. Every day he was hoping that the son would come back home. And I believe it's that way with God. No matter how far we get from God, I believe that God is always looking for us to come back home. He never lets us go. The Bible says, and this is a great promise in the Bible, the Bible says that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And if you would look at that verse in another version of the Bible, it's translated, God will never, no, never leave us. It's, it's a double negative. God will never leave us, no, never leave us or forsake us. You can't outrun God. No matter how far you go, I believe that God still works on us. I don't care where you find yourself. I believe that God is still talking to us. God, I know that from experience, that God keeps talking to us. He keeps warning us to come back home. The Bible says that the father saw him afar off and ran. He ran to the boy. He ran to his son. He hugged him. He hugged him and kissed him. hugged him, kissed him, and welcomed the boy home. And the Bible says that the boy, even though he had rehearsed his speech, the father doesn't even seem to let him give his speech. He was just glad that the boy was back home again. The boy, the Bible says, uh, welcomed home by his father and look at how the father treated him. He didn't even ask the boy, where you been? He didn't, he didn't say to the boy, you know you shouldn't have left here like you did. He didn't give him a speech. He didn't beat him down. 
He was just glad that his son was back home. And any parent, you know, any parent, any mother, any father, you, when you love your child, it doesn't matter what they do and where they go, you just love your child. Good, bad, or indifferent, you love your child. When they do good, you love them. When they do bad, you love them. Because that's your job. And sometimes, sometimes they are not always what we want them to be. But they are still our job. And we still love our children no matter what. I, I tend to believe that God's love for us, the way I understand it as a father, that God's love for us is like a, a parent's a love for their child. I mean, the way you feel about your child, that you don't want them to be hungry, you don't want them to be destitute, you don't want them to be in need of anything, you want the best for them. That, that's a parent's love for your child. Even when they get in trouble, you bail them out, you may be mad about bailing them out, but that's still your child. And because you love your child, you love them unconditionally. Now I must say that we see the unconditional love of the Father. Look at how we see it. Number one, we see his unconditional love because he the fir because first of all, he loved the boy enough to let him go. He loved him enough to let him go. And sometimes you have to love people enough to let them go. No matter how hard you try to keep them, sometimes you've got to let them go. Sometimes there is peace in letting them go. It doesn't mean that you don't pray for them. It doesn't mean that you still hope that God will bless their lives. That's not what that means at all. But sometimes you have to let them go. Listen, you know what I've learned about grown folk? Uh, uh, some grown folk, you can't tell grown folk what to do as much as you want to. You can't tell them what the grown folk do, whatever grown folk want to do. And sometimes you have to let them go. And that was the unconditional love of the father. He couldn't say, no, I ain't going to give you the portion that falls to you. Go back in the field and work. That's not what he said. The Bible says that he gave the boy what the boy was asking for, and he let the boy go. That was unconditional love. The second part of unconditional love is not only did he let him go, he let him come home. He let him come back with, with, with no strings attached. Okay, he, 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 didn't, he, put, he didn't put conditions on it. He didn't say, well, you can come back as long as you promise never to go back again. That is what he said. Now, now we, we probably would say that, and I think there's some wisdom in that too. Uh, he didn't say, well, you can come back if you pay rent. I think there's some, I think there's some wisdom in that. I think that uh, young people who think they're grown should pay rent. I want you to hear what I just said. I think young people who think they're grown should pay rent. Nothing is free. They can't live anywhere for nothing. And, and, and get this, and get this. They would rather pay a stranger than pay you. They'll pay rent to a stranger, but they won't pay rent for living with you. And get this, they live with you eating your food. Sucking up your air conditioning in the, in the summer and heat in the winter. They have cable in their room. And probably the television they look at that they didn't even buy. But when you ask for rent, they act like you said a dirty word. Well, the father let him come back, and we don't see any conditions on them coming back. Guess what God does? When you repent and turn back to God, 
He doesn't put conditions on that. God doesn't say, well, I'll forgive you if you promise never to do it again. Now, he, he could. He could have worded it that way. Well, I'll only forgive them if they never do it again. Now, Lord knows, if God had said that, we would be in trouble. Because there are some things we've done and we said, God, if you get me out this time, I'll never do it again. And guess what? God has gotten us out of some things. Somebody say amen. Amen. God has gotten us out of some things. God has gotten us out of some situations. And we ended up going right back to the same thing that God got us out of. And guess what? If we would repent, God would let us come back. Thank God he is a forgiving God. He forgives us unconditionally. It does not mean he wants us to continue in a behavior. That's not what the, the, the scripture teaches. That once he saves us, he gives us the power not to go in sin again. A sinful lifestyle. That's what the Bible teaches. We have the power not to go back in sinful relationships again. That's what the Bible teaches. Okay? Because we are human, we all go in sin. And the Bible says, all have sinned and falling short of the glory of God. And all God is waiting for us to do is to come back. And I believe that from, I, I really truly believe this, that from the leaders in our country, to the leaders of our churches, to the leaders of our states and cities, if we would just turn back Pray for each other. Turn back. I believe that God would turn things around. I believe that deep in my heart. And I believe until we get there, we're going to find ourselves still in the house. Locked in. Amen. Locked in with masks on our faces. And look how bad it's getting. You know, when, when they said to us, just in the past week, when they said to us, uh, they might have a, a, a cure for this virus. I don't know about you, I was excited about it. good news. That, that, that some cures look promising. That, that was good news. It was good to hear that. All right? And, and, and I said, that, that's great news. And, and for a minute, I said, well, maybe this is going to turn around. Lo and behold, now people are trying to get out. Tired of being in the house. Tired, tired of not being sick. We want to take a chance. I, I, I looked on the news and... Uh, even on the news, uh, there was some, some, some folk waiting in line, waiting in line, not six feet apart, trying to get the newest Air Jordan shoes. Waiting in line to get the latest. Now, now, now number one, when you bomb, where you going to go? Where well, well. you going to land at? Who, who looking for you? And, and, and ladies, I hate to say this. I, I hate to tell you this. I, I hate to tell you this. The place, the number one place that they found that women are going to are nail salons. It was ahead of it was ahead of 
hairdresser, it was ahead of barber shops, it was ahead of the gym, it was ahead of the movie theaters. The number one place that women needed to go was to get their nails did. Lord, thank you. Because when our heads are hard, when our hearts are hard, we will go back to some of the things that God was trying to get us out of in the first place. Listen, I, I want to go to the barbershop too. Uh, those of you watching on Facebook, uh, my, you know, I, I want to go to the barbershop too. All right? It'd be nice to go and get shaped up and trimmed up and all that. I want to go too. But guess what? I want to live more than I want to look good for you. Because I'm telling you, uh, what y'all going to do? Y'all going to look at, at uh, y'all going to look in the casket and say Lisa's head is shaped up. Lisa's beard is trimmed up. No, I want to live more than I need my hair cut. And guess what? Because I want you to live. I'm not going to go out there and make it unsafe for you. We, we need to protect each other. And I believe that God is really trying to get our attention. And when I saw the news of people tired of staying in the house on the beaches, in the sand, in the water, tired of staying in the house, I said to myself, and now the leaders are bending, are giving in to what the people want. You know who got in trouble because they did what the people wanted? Saul. The Bible says King Saul was pressured by the people when he was confronted with the army. And he says to Samuel, I was looking at the people and we are in a time when we can't take cues from people. We have to take our lead from our God. And we have to do it God's way. Because God's way is still the best way. The Bible says that the boy came home, the father let him come back home, but the father didn't leave it at that. The, the father, the, the father put, a, he put a robe on the boy. He put a robe on the boy, and the robe, the robe stands for royalty. He put a robe on him. The robe stands for royalty. He put a ring on the boy's finger. The ring stands for authority. He gave the boy his authority back again. Put a robe for royalty. Put a ring for authority. And the last thing that the father did for this boy is he put shoes on his feet. He put shoes on his feet. Only slaves didn't have shoes. Only slaves were barefooted. And the father put shoes on the boy's feet. He was saying to the boy, you are not a servant, you are not a slave, but you are, you are a son. And if you don't hear anything else I say today, I want you to really get in your mind that God wants you to be royalty. He has given you authority. And you are a son. You are a daughter. For as many as received him, to them gave he power, authority, authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I believe that's St. John 1 and 12. For as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Let, let me say this. Let me say this too. Listen. You have authority 
you have authority over the devil. The devil can't make you. He broke the power of sin over our lives. Okay? Those of you who are listening, listening, I'm writing. That's why you hear the hesitation. I'm writing some things on the board for our Facebook watchers. Okay? He, God broke the power of sin over our lives. That means, that means that the devil can present it, but I can say no to whatever the devil presents to me. He has given me the power to say no. Uh -uh. Flee from sin. Draw nigh to God, and God will draw nigh to you. Resist the devil. And he shall flee from you. He doesn't have that kind of control over you any longer. Because when you accepted Jesus, the power of sin was broken over your life. You can say yes to God. This is important. You can say yes to God. Now you have the authority, uh, the authority to say Yes to God and no to the devil. All right? You have been given that authority. And listen, what you don't want to do is give away your authority. Don't let him take that from you. Don't let him think he can do anything to you that he wants. You know, Early in my salvation, I really did think the devil could do anything that he wanted to do to the believer. Early in my salvation, I thought he could just do whatever he wanted to do to, to the believer. Well, that's not true. That's not true. Number one, I have authority to say yes to God, no to sin. But, but here is the second part of this. If God allows the devil to do something in my life. If, listen to this. If, if God allows the devil to do something in my life, if he allows it, it means that God's going to give me the power to withstand whatever he brings. Because there is the permissive will of God. The permissive will of God. And, and all, all that's really saying is there are some things God will permit to happen. But before he permits it, guess what? The devil has to ask God for permission. And if God gives him permission, it only means, and this is, this is the great news, it only means that God is set, setting you up for something greater in your life. Don't, don't see it as a negative. Many times when something bad happens, I'm included in that. Whenever something bad would happen, I would always say to God, well, Lord, I don't know why you let that happen to me. When in reality, God knows what he's doing. And if God lets something happen in my life, it only means he, has, he is setting me up for something better to happen in my life. And that's why, now I know, now I know this sounds a little bit crazy. This doesn't make any sense at all. That's why, that's why I always know that whenever the devil shows up in your life, God is up to something in your life. Because the only thing the devil can do 
is sell wolf tickets. And that's what he'll do. He'll talk about huffing and puffing. He'll blow your house down. Well, see, you need to have the mindset, well, devil, if you blow this house down, it must mean God has a bigger and better house for me. Go ahead and blow. Take your best shot. There's something in store that's better for me in my life. So, so, so don't, don't, don't go crazy just because something crazy is happening in your life. Listen, if you live long enough, all of us will have some crazy happening in our lives. If you live long enough. But know that whenever crazy starts happening in your life, it's a sign. That's what I want you to get. It's a sign. It's a sign that God is up to something greater. I'll close on this note. I, 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 you know, I, I, I learned that I could um, purchase these audio books. You know, the books that will read, they'll read the book to you. I, I learned, I learned how to, to purchase some audio books. I, 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 well, I, I, I love it. First time, I love it. I, I've been reading a book, and the book is entitled Leadership Pain. Leadership, Leadership Pain. All right? And, it's, and it says, Leadership Pain, the classroom, the classroom, for growth. Leadership pain. The classroom for growth. If you are going to grow, the author says, it will come by some kind of pain in your life. Now, we don't like that. Doesn't sound good. But understand, and you know by now, understand you know by now, you're not going to get out of this life without going through some pain, some painful situations. You're going to go through some, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. But you've got to know that that pain was engineered by God to get you to a place he wants you to go. Amen, Celia. I hope y'all quiet because you're writing. Amen. Leadership pain. The classroom for growth by Samuel Chain. Samuel Chain. C H A N D. Samuel Chain. Good book. He talks about it on different levels. That no matter what level you're on, you're going to have to go through some pain in order to go to get to the growth. Gives illustrations of uh, some saints and what they had to go through uh, to get to a higher place in the kingdom. It comes by pain in your life. And God engineers the pain. You know, we've been hearing, and I'm going to close, we've been hearing for years. It's a cliche. We say it. We've been hearing it for years. God wouldn't put more on me than we can bear. God wouldn't put more on us than we can bear. We've been hearing that for years. All right? And sometimes we have to convince ourselves, well, God, you wouldn't put it on me if you didn't think I could bear it. Well, that's profound truth. God wouldn't allow anything to happen to you that he couldn't give you the victory over. So when you see, when you experience some things in your life, know that always God is in charge. And sometimes, Lord help me, sometimes it's not the devil but it's God. 
it's not always the devil. Sometimes it's God. Amen. Well, we're going to close. Uh, any, any questions, any comments about any of that material? Any questions, any comments about, about any of that? All right, okay. If there are no questions or comments, I want to thank all of you for tuning in today. Thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, watching. I pray that you receive something today that will bless you, that will help you in your walk with the Lord. Pray for, pray for me, pray for my family, pray for the church. I'm praying for churches all over the land. I hear uh, members on the church uh, on the call who are uh, uh, former now members, that's what I'm going to call you, former now members, and I, I was glad to hear from you, glad to see you, and uh, pray for, let's pray for each other, pray for our country, pray for the leaders of our country, we, we need to be in prayer, it's, 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 rough. it's a rough time right now, and I don't believe God's going to turn it around until the leaders in this country repent and turn back to him. Any, any prayer concerns? Any prayer concerns? All right. Uh, Sister Haynes? Yes, sir. Will you, will you close us out in prayer, please? Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a good, good week in Jesus. See you, see you Sunday.